Uh, th thank you, Laura, for giving me five minutes. I will try to keep it in five, but no promises. Um, so uh, many of you are familiar with my art, and uh, about ten pieces, five of them, I made them recently, are here, and uh, people have seen them. So um, I can talk about something which is a little bit known. And I often get the question, um, whether I have in my mind what I'm making before I start. And I, I always have to say, no, I don't, which is true. And then I also say, um, I know what I do, but I don't know what I'm making. So today, in this brief presentation, I hope to clarify a little bit to you um, what I'm doing and what I'm making. And um, I cannot say I'm making something which I aim for because I don't. So I will try to answer this question through discussing Renaissance, Renaissance art. So here you see, um, and I will talk, tell you about the discovery of perspective. And, uh, and here you see a, a beautiful painting um, from 13... 43 by Ambrogio Lorenzetti and this is one of the first examples where clearly the painter knows his perspective. You can see it is used in a very limited way but the floor tiles are really well done. It's clear that this guy knew his, his perspective uh, uh, rules. And a few years later about a 150 year later, this painting is following the rules of perspective perfectly and something very interesting happens to the viewer. Namely, you end up feeling like looking through a window. So while it gives this huge spatial feeling, it also pushes you out of, of this space. And uh, you are kind of standing back from what you're looking at. So interestingly, um, in, the, in the rules of perspective, the viewer is reduced to a point. And points equal perspectives. So when you make a painting and you use the rules of perspective, it must be clear in advance from which point somebody is looking. And that can be any point, but a given point is decisive for how, how you uh, draw the lines of perspective, so to speak. And this is um, a picture from a treatise called The Pectura by Leo, Leon Battista Alberti in 1635. Now I, will now I will go a few years further in history and we'll show you this beautiful painting by Peter Klaas, uh, Klaassen. So that is Peter, the son of Klaas. And I don't think it's the title breakfast, but it's at the time they probably ate herring and uh, also beer in the morning with some bread. I'm not familiar with eating that in the morning, but maybe they did that in the Netherlands in 1636. Now this is not just an amazing painting, um, it also looks as if this painter is not so much concerned with perspective, but he is. And when you look at the writings in those years, you can also read that these painters were actually very, very aware of the rules of perspective. And you could also say that, argue that this painting wouldn't have been possible had not been the rules of perspective known very well. Because, and I will not go into the details, but there are some interesting studies of this particular painting and also some others like this. The, 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 the lines of perspective in this painting are such that it is as if the herring and the plate on which the herring is lying is pushed into your room. Um, Schopenhauer, you know, the, the famous German philosopher, actually argued against those paintings. He thought they had to be forbidden 
because they made him so hungry. So something very interesting is going on here in this painting. And I'll leave you to that. Just enjoy it. We are not, we are wanting to, we want to enjoy these paintings and be one, feel, having a feeling of wonder like what is going on here in this painting such that it's so beautiful and it is as if this plate is actually something I could take from that table. Okay, that was the rules of perspective. And now I move to my own art. And um, I called my, this small presentation, the recovering of subjectivity, because I'm doing something which you might say is opposite to using rules of perspective. Um, some of you have seen this painting in real. It's on the, all around the corner here. And others have seen it in the Max Planck Institute. I think that was in 2017. And um, what I'm doing is now not the issue. It takes several months to make such a, such a painting. I think this cost me like four and a half months. I know this stuff because I make photos while I make them. So I have the dates. I can see when I made my first photo and when I made my last photo. So this kind of information is pretty well known to me as an artist. And I am doing something which I have written down here on this piece of paper. I, want, I create a view. What you see here is a view. So instead of focusing on the on the viewer and fixing the viewer in a position where I think you lose perspective, no, sorry, where you lose subjectivity, I'm sorry. Here, what I do is I, I, I turn to the view and uh, make it unclear uh, from what position you are actually looking at this view. Um, there, are, there is no indication what is top, there is no indication what is down, there is no indication what is left or right. That's all yours. So in other words, if the picture doesn't tell you what your position is, it so to speak frees you in your, and, and sort of stresses your subjectivity. So here is another example where the, the the uh, subjectivity is, so to speak, freed. And I'll give you another example where I'm not entirely doing that. There is some indication here of, of um, a French uh, flag. Uh, um, uh, there is some indication of water, um, um, ripples in the water. So here I'm a little bit working against my own principles but it makes you again aware of actually creating paintings more like this, where again, you have no idea what is, what is the orientation that is preferred. You may have a preferred orientation, but that's your preference. And I'll show you another one, which is again going a little bit against my rules, but here I'm playing with space and I have first drawn these three red lines, which give you an impression of depth. And I push a lot of colors into this thing. And actually, I also pushed in a bird. And this strengthens the notion of space. But actually, of course, this is a flat thing. It's 2D. Nothing could be flatter. This is a recent one where, again, there is no notion of orientation. So you may have preferences, but those are your subjective preferences. The painting is not in any way telling you what should be top, down, left, right, or even what should be your distance from it. And this is my final work. I finished it about a week ago. Usually, uh, my paintings take several months. This one took me several hours. So by my standards, that is like a second, like a split second. But again, here something interesting happens with regards to one's subjectivity. Namely, try to think away the red pieces 
and what you see is a bit of a, a blurry space, flat, but if you add those red uh, uh, corners, uh, what happens somehow is that the background starts to become voluminous. And I think the reason is simple, namely um, the eye wants those red sharp lines not to be from at the same distance from you as this background is. So somehow there must be space in between where those red lines are, or these corners are, and where the black and white is. So, and this is my final point, and um, so you might think it's a little bit uh, uh, unclear what I mean by that. So what, I, what it looks like that I'm doing, in contrast to what happens in the perspective rules, is that I take away the synthetic a priori, you know, the Kantian category, where it's about the preconditions for having experiences at all. By taking them away, kind of, I'm forcing you as an experiencer to, to search for and to keep searching for a way of orienting you with respect to what I show you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Hector. I'm here in New York, and I'm going to give a little, uh, um, very short presentation um, about about the possibility of uh, making a comparison between jam session and uh, the the scientific uh, method of uh, collaboration, like Laura so nice described right now. I'm going to share with you guys a little bit uh, of a presentation. Uh, Cesar, se ve? Si. Okay. So uh, it's called Jam Session, a heuristic for cooperative production, also in science, question. And I have to say, for full disclosure, this, this, is, uh, this presentation is a perfect example of a very fast and very frugal um, process. Uh, I learned about heuristic just uh, in the last couple of um, weeks, uh, so to, um, to say, because uh, it's something I never really delved into before. And, uh, but jazz is, um, is a very good example of a kind of um, fast and frugal heuristic because uh, very, there's very limited, um, there's very limited information and um, it's a kind of instant composition from the very beginning in New Orleans. It was a collective improvisation, which is kind of instant composition. And um, we have to say uh, that jazz is in, at the very end, it's not what you play. You don't play jazz, you play, it's how you play it. How you play the music. You can take any music and, um, and take it to places where you want and where you, you, your peers also went uh, together. And there are several um, concepts that sh are shared with, uh, with uh, erudite uh, composition, with classical composition, for example, repetition of something, of a theme, variation of a theme, a difference, um, co a con conscious difference of thematic uh, development. Then a conscious contrast not only a difference, but a completely um, contrasting theme that makes it more interesting, one uh, put against the other. And then an element of randomness, which um, is the last level of, of context that you can imagine from, from repetition, which is the perfect um, level of context of um, intention to randomness, which is uh, the last. And um, all this I, I kind of saw as a very good example of un, unbounded rationality in classical music where you have all the time and all the resources available as you can see in the group playing behind. Everybody has um, music stands, there's a conductor, everybody's looking at the conductor and the conductor obviously is following the score that someone wrote probably many centuries ago with a lot of time, a lot of knowledge, a lot of uh, input from, um, from many different sources, including tradition. Uh, but we're gonna talk about that 
uh, later. What's about, what's about in, um, in jazz is the importance of agreeing to disagree. So there are some things you can agree. Uh, and have, I have to say, disagree doesn't mean um, there's another level of disagreement, which is not agreeing. So you leave it up to the moment. It's not necessary disagreement. It's just not agreeing um, to something and um, not necessary have to agree on that point, but not also not disagreeing. It's kind of a subtle thing that you, um, you discover while playing jazz, especially in jam sessions where there is very little input, very little agreed upon constants that I call uh, trying to mimic a little bit my limited knowledge of scientific um, lingu uh, language. Constants, you have a structure. Uh, blues. That's a, con that's a structure that has a form of 12 bars. It has basically three sections in the tonic and the subdominant and the dominant and certain other secondary harmonies that you can add or not add. It depends on you, but everybody understands that these secondary uh, harmonies are related to the main three harmonies that, uh, that um, um, create the main structure. That's uh, one thing. Then melody, there's an input, there's a con uh, composed melody that everybody knows, standard music. And you have that uh, uh, as an input that also helps you create the output. So it's an interactive uh, situation. Uh, and then the, the things that, that are not agreed upon, of course, not disagreed upon, but they are not necessarily set. So you can agree or you, you can disagree. Um, and then I um, mentioned three different levels of information that you have uh, of uh, knowledge. First is just plain information. There's limited resources of information. There is very limited time. You know the tune, you hear the reaction of the improviser, and then you react to that. The second tier is knowledge that you, um, you take from tradition, that you get from studying, from practicing. That is your knowledge. And then wisdom. It's instincts that develop over the years by practicing and then by doing uh, many, many jam sessions and just reacting constantly. So that's the, the higher level of, of knowledge that I can discern. Uh, then we go, um, uh, we can see in this picture the, uh, the level of nonverbal communication nonverbal information that are, is shared amongst these musicians. They're looking at each other, trying to react at, at, at um, attacks from the, from the mouth into the trombone, for example, of, or uh, expressions in the face, or not only listening, but a lot of visual information is very important. And uh, in this case, uh, language, spoken language is very irrelevant. Uh, but still there's a language that you have learned, which is the language of jazz and the language of music more in general. Uh, and that I would call adaptive rationality, which is a hip name for this kind of, um, I don't know if, it, if it's uh, something that you would agree upon, um, scientists that, uh, that um, um, discuss uh, rationality in, in scientific discourse. Uh, here uh, is what I kind of imagine. I took this out from an engineering uh, website, um, but it's a positive loop, um, feedback loop, feedback loop, which reinforces. And this is kind of what I see happening in improvisation, where there's an input, as I mentioned, a melody and a form, and there is disturbance created by the improviser, by the soloist. And then before it goes back to the output, it gets a feedback and it creates a loop. Uh, the other musicians uh, react to that information, to that disturbance, to that very fast and very frugal information and reinforce it. And at the same time, the soloist reacts to that feedback and it creates a loop that eventually um, simultaneously uh, comes out 
and, 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 and go to the ears of the listener. So this is something that you can um, adapt from engineering into what happens in a jam session or in an improvisation. Jam session is a special, um, is a special situation because there's no rehearsal. There's very little, um, very little in, agreed upon information except form and melody and, prob and maybe rhythm or uh, yeah, the rhythm that you decide to use. Uh, here we have something uh, that in my very fast uh, uh, investigations and research I found uh, in, uh, in Wikipedia, what can be easier and faster and more frugal than Wikipedia about the scientific method. And you can see some of it you can, uh, um, you can translate, transfer to the music language. Characterization, you observe, you define and you measure the subject of inquiry, meaning the melody, the theme, the subject. In, in music, you call the melody also the subject. So it's interesting that the language overlaps. Hypothesis, okay, you create in your head a possible variations of that, uh, of that melody and uh, try to make a better melody, a more interesting one, uh, and then you have predictions. That's what happens with the other musicians that create predictions of what is going to happen next and how to react to that and how he is going to react to your income, to your reasoning. And then experiment. Experiment is what you do when you play jazz. And here we have an, another, uh, sorry, I'm going back. Here you have another flow diagram, which is very similar to the other one that we had before and a little more extensive and more specific, but it's very, very similar to the feedback, feedback loop that I described. It's just for illustrative purposes. It's not uh, for any scientific, but um, I like the similarity between both, um, both diagrams. Uh, and then we have um, something I have I've thought of, um, of um, um, example in scientific uh, research that is very similar and is what's happening now uh, um, this right this moment uh, globally at a global at a global level uh, finding the vaccine for the covid uh, virus and and uh, what is happening there's a, a very limited time limited resources we have genome the genome that was uh, made public as fast as possible and <clears throat> There's unlimited resources in, time, in terms of money. It's non-frugal. But there's limited information about the virus. It's, it's happening every day. There's a lot of new, new um, information coming out and being processed in a very, um, that information is, um, is uh, processed as we go, on the go, like a real jam session in real time. And then it's unlimited information, all the archives and, and data uh, amassed over hundreds of years of um, biological and, and chemical and other types of research that are uh, useful in this situation. It's like the knowledge, the wisdom of the musician when uh, he uh, gets this limited information and uh, with limited resources, with very little time, because time is really of um, a very uh, limited nature in this race for a vaccine. And um, so you can uh, imagine the situation right now is a global jam session. And we're going to make uh, an example, very limited resources, a melody. Two notes, uh, repeated one of them, repeat a couple of times, and then there is a resolution of the note of the melody in the last note, which is the, the tonic in this case. Um, the first note is the, do the dominant, the second note is the tonic. Um, that is going to happen three times because we're playing a blues. A blues has three sections, as I mentioned before. And then we have variation. We have variation. Changing the rhythm or changing a little bit of the pitch. Difference. That's not variation. Difference. That's a, a difference. Contrast. And randomness. All 
that can happen in one solo. Um, so we go two chords. Last chord. Then Thank you very much.